Well, thank you for um, organising this. It's really in interesting to kind of bring this um, all together. So I'm Mandy MacDonald. Um, I'm a lecturer in social work. Um, I've worked in social work before that, um, uh, in adoption, and we looked after children. Um, but now I'm a lecturer here at Queen's. Um, and so myself and Kathleen are going to talk about this piece of research that we did a little while ago. And the first thing to say was is that this was with formal kinship foster carers. So these were all people who had been assessed, um, who were receiving fostering allowances and who were receiving a social work service. So that's the first thing to say. Um, we've done another piece of work around looking at informal kinship care. And I think, Anna, you have nicely drawn out um, how there are tensions between people who are involved with social workers and people who aren't. And um, that's where some of the inequalities arise. So. Um, as Paula said, uh, this was a piece of work done by Stan Houston, who unfortunately can't be with us today because he now works in Dublin. Divi Hayes, who's busy elsewhere. Lynn um, Johnson, who's here, was uh, uh, did a lot of the analysis um, of this project, so feel free, Lynn, to chip in. <laughs> um, and uh, it was instigated um, as a project by the Fostering Network, um, and it is very much based around their membership. Um, so Kathleen Toner, who is the director of the Fostering Network in Northern Ireland, is going to um, just set a bit of a context for the work, and then Kathleen's going to sum up at the end, just to let you know there's the article. Okay, so there's a report, but also there's an article that summarises all of this presentation, and um, you can take it away. It's on the back table there. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Mandy says, uh, I'm Kathleen Toner, and I work in the Fostering Network. For those of you who don't know. The Fostering Network, um, we're a charity and we work with foster carers and with kinship foster carers and we're a membership organisation but we also provide a range of services and currently we have 1,400 non-relative carers and approximately 800 kinship foster carers and if we look back over 10 years that, uh, that those numbers look very, very different and I think that's because there has been a significant increase in the number of children who are looked after within our system who are living with family. Um, at the minute, in Northern Ireland, we have almost 3,000 children and young people who are looked after. Um, and that is the biggest number that we've had and is an increase of 15% since 2011 and doesn't really show any signs, I'm sure the social workers in the room will agree, um, of slowing down any time soon. Um, given that we have a population of 1.8 million, that's a really high percentage of, of young people who are looked after. Um, I met with some social workers last week from the um, University of Maryland and they have a population of 1.4 million and currently have 600 children who are looked after. So we have five times that number who are in state care. Um, and of those children, as you might anticipate, the, the policy d um, directive has been to have them looked after within family environments. And traditionally, that has been within non-relative foster care situations. So 2,225 of those children are currently living in, in foster situations. But 42% um, of those are now living in kinship. And I know we have colleagues here from Western Trust and, and from Kinship Care and I. And um, I think it's... Um, it's interesting that within the Western Trust area, almost 60% of your children in, in that area are looked after. So actually that curve has turned and it has gone the, the other direction. Um, and I think that's been very important because one of the things that we've seen is there's been a big um, policy shift um, here, or proposed policy shift, and we have the development of a looked after children's strategy that's around at the minute with the Department of Health and Department of Education, and there's been some significant work done on that. But I think, um, listening to what Anna was saying, and, and I'm sure what other contributors will say, is that we probably need an anti-poverty strategy that stands alongside that to work with children who are on the edge of care and families who are struggling. Um, we decided to do this piece of research, and we commissioned Queen's with funding from the Health and Social Care Board and with um, funding from the Department of Education um, some about three, four years ago because we could see that our numbers and, and the characteristics of our foster care population was starting to shift and we wanted to get a sense of what the needs and the concerns of our foster carers were and the experiences that they had. So Mandy's going to talk about the detail of the findings of that but I have a couple of my staff, Craig and, and Nilla, who work with 200 foster carers each. Um, we have seven staff who work on one of our big programmes, Fostering Achievement. and. Um, they all work with about 200 foster carers annually and um, both of them have been in post about 10 years and have very much seen that shift and that change and that was partly what was helping 
to inform our organisational concerns about well, are the services that we're providing actually meeting the needs of the people that, that we're seeking to work with. As Mandy said, we do work with foster care, kinship foster carers who are approved foster carers. So where a child has been taken into care um, and they may be voluntary accommodated, it could be an interim care order, it could be a full care order, but that foster carer then goes through a process of assessment. And there is a sense of, um, I suppose, concern for those people that they've never perhaps encountered social services before. There's an anxiety about that access point. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for my family? Um, and I suppose the kind of issues that were coming through our advice and information helpline were somewhat different than we were seeing perhaps from non-relative carers. And some of them were around that interface with social services. Some of those were around the fact that, you know, some of the issues that Anna has said and that Mandy will um, refer to around um, managing f uh, the finance. But I suppose for the very stark thing for us is that a non-relative carer makes a very positive choice. You decide you've got to a point in your life and, and you want to become a foster carer and you think it fits with your lifestyle, it fits with your values, with your attitudes. Um, you've done a bit of research, um, you present yourself to fostering services and say, assess me. Kinship care, that couldn't be further from the truth. And they enter um, a kinship arrangement, usually through a crisis situation, that is very traumatic for them as individuals, very often as a grandmother, because the biggest majority of kinship carers are grandmothers, um, often where their child has faced a crisis and they're now having to deal perhaps with their grandchildren or great-grandchildren. And they're dealing with that trauma and they're trying to get their head around all of that. And they find themselves in this situation where they're having to think about finances and fostering allowances. And I mean, as somebody said to me one day, um, I don't know, have I been assessed? Did, and they had had their assessment panel the previous day and they had really no concept that they had been assessed and approved by social services. So, you know, so even though they were engaged in this whole process, and there was a sense of it being done onto them as opposed to them being part of the process. I think you'll probably find when Mandy goes through this that a lot of the issues that came across are very similar. They're around finance, they're around managing that whole issue of, of that interface and um, dealing with the children as well. Um, in terms of perhaps challenging behaviours, um, relating to perhaps health services, CAMs, etc. But one of the things that I think is really important, because one of the services that we provide is for families on the edge of care, and very often those children who are on the edge of care, their outcomes are really quite poor in comparison to children who are either in kinship, formal kinship, or non-relative care. And I think that one of the things that we see is that care can work. And I've left a copy of a book that's not this research, but a piece of work that we did called Not So Broken about a year ago. And we do have some um, stories from foster carers, from kinship carers, and from the young people who have experienced both types of care, because rarely does a child have one, often they're looked after by a granny, um, or maybe they've gone into non-relative care and they go to a grandparent, or they could move around lots of different types of provision. And one of them, um, Andrea, talked about how being with her grandparents was absolutely life-changing for her. And interestingly, that it didn't bother her that she was fostered. Um, she said she had a friend who was in a similar situation. My granny and granda don't believe in splitting up families. They've always wanted us to be together. And for that, I will be eternally grateful. Fostering is brilliant for children. And I'd like to say anyone thinking about doing it should just do it without my granny and granda. We'd probably have been split up, moved around and wouldn't be able to see each other. And that's just too awful to think about. And I think that that's, you know, really important testimony. And I think it's something that we need to hold on to. But we do need to seriously support and resource that to make sure that it can happen effectively for all children. Um, that's the context, Mandy, I'll let okay. you <laughs> go ahead. Catherine, you're going to at the I end am, yeah. sum up with some of this. So Catherine, um, what I'm going to do is just really take you through the study, um, just very briefly, um, and at the end, Catherine, I think, will sum up some of the key messages and some of the implications for um, our practice. Okay. So, and then that's all I'm going to just t uh, take you through that. Um, so our aim with this study was um, to really just uh, find out um, for this cohort of people who are uh, approved kinship foster carers in Northern Ireland, um, what their characteristics, needs and experiences were across a whole range. So their demographic profile, their perceptions of the children's needs, um, 
their histories of how they ca came to be kinship carers and how they found that process and what their own needs were as individuals, as people, but as kinship foster carers as well. Um, what their experience was of their relationship with formal supports and informal supports. Um, and just to gain some insights for policy and practice out of that. Uh, so we basically um, did this all through Fostering Network and the Fostering Network uh, uh, support workers. Um, and uh, we had uh, 54 kinship foster carers um, who agreed to take part in the first stage of the study, which was a detailed survey questionnaire that uh, the support workers, the fostering network, link worker, um, sorry, development worker, I was calling them support workers, I knew I got the title wrong, development worker, um, took out with them uh, to carers' homes and, and talked through. Um, so it was a structured interview uh, questionnaire that we used in a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, and I say we had 54 carers. Those were all, so that was 54 families, okay? Because what we asked was for somebody in that family to identify themselves as the main carer in, for that family. And we left it up to the family to decide who was the main carer in that family. Uh, we then, uh, and we've done some uh, descriptive statistics and cross tabulations with age that I'll just talk you through briefly here. Uh, we then had um, a subsample out of the people who completed that stage um, of nine um, families who um, participated in in-depth interviews um, and, uh, and we analysed those through a thematic analysis. In some of those cases, it was couples who participated in those interviews. Um, so I'll actually move on a bit um, and just tell you about the carers and their households. Um, so you'll see there that um, one of the key things, and the key things for this um, session, um, is around the age of our carers. So over half of the carers, 59% of the people who took part in that survey uh, were aged over 50. Um, and if we look at the people who were aged over 40, it was 82% of them were aged over 40. Um, and a smaller number, um, but about a quarter of the overall number of people uh, were aged in their 60s. Uh, over half the sample were grandparents. Um, and most of those grandparents were grandmothers. Um, and it was very gendered, our sample. So among the people who self-identified as being the primary carer in this household, um, almost all of them, 89% of them, uh, were female. And they were either grandmothers or aunts. We had about 31% uh, who were aunts, actually. Um, most of those people had been caring for the children for over two years. So these were arrangements where people were quite bedded in um, and could reflect back on that process and think about what had gone on. So because they had been caring for a couple of years, their relationships with social services were quite well established by this stage. So we weren't going to people in the first um, chaos or the first crisis of placement. We were going to them at a stage where they had an opportunity to reflect on their experiences. Uh, the 54 respondents to the survey between them um, were fostering 82 children. That's not the total number of children who were in people's households. People were caring for a lot more children in their own houses than that. Um, but there were 82 fostered children. Um, okay. There Finances then, and Anna has um, flagged this up as an issue, and across informal and formal kinship carers, um, what we know is that there are higher proportions of kinship care, both formal and informal, in lower socioeconomic groupings in our society. Okay, So we know that from large census data studies like Selwyn and Nandy's study that Anna has referred to. Um, what we were interested in then was, if we take away we're not looking at all the people who are informal. We'll say, if we take that out of the picture, um, what, what, is the, what do finances and the um, subjective 
financial well-being of people look like uh, when they're formal kinship foster carers. So we asked them about their self-reported net weekly income and how it felt to them. Did they feel that things were sufficient? So the first thing to say is that all of our survey respondents were in receipt of fostering allowances from social services. My understanding of fostering allowances for kinship foster carers is that they have to be paid at the same rate as non-kinship foster carers. So people were getting for their particular child and they're on a sliding scale according to the age of the child and they're attached to the child. Um, so people were getting for the age of the child that they had fostered, they were getting the same allowance as a non-kinship foster carer would have been getting for the same child, had the same child been with a stranger. Okay? Um, so there were about 74%, so about three quarters of people said that the allowance that they received for that child was adequate for the child. Okay? However, we had about... Um, over a third of our sample, is it here? Yeah, you'll see there that more than a third of our sample said that their financial position was a bit of a struggle at times, um, and a fair number of them said that it was actually quite challenging. So, so why is that? If people are saying, the people who said that the fostering allowance was not adequate for the child um, had a perception that fostering allowances hadn't kept pace with the cost of living, and I think that's probably a comment on fostering allowances generally for all foster carers. They felt that, that they were unrealistic compared to the cost of living. And they also felt that they were unrealistic compared to the real cost of actually rearing a child. Um, most of the children in our sample were teenagers, interestingly. And I think there's another piece of work to be done to tease out what types of children go where and the age groups of children who go where. So most of the children in this sample were teenagers, um, or po sorry, in their post-primary school years anyway. Um, and like Anna said, the man who said 30 pounds isn't gonna buy you even a third of a pair of a trainers, right? Um, people in our survey were saying, do people know what a teenage boy eats? And how expensive it is to keep a teenage boy fed when he comes through your cupboards like a plague of locusts when he comes home from school, okay? So there was a feeling that those allowances were unrealistic. There was also a feeling that people were taking, looking after children in a context when they already were in a position of hardship. So while the allowance might be adequate to meet their needs, it wasn't enough to do anything beyond adequate, but also it was in, it, they were caring for children with fostering allowances in a context when their own family situation was really very straightened and they had very few other buffers or um, resources to draw on in their lives. And they were also a bit concerned about the future and their future um, financial well-being. Um, also in terms of their employment status, interestingly there was only 25% um, of people who responded to the survey who were in employment. Um, and uh, only 15% who worked full time. Okay, um, uh, a third of them were unemployed, or um, sorry, almost half were unemployed, and almost a third described themselves as retired. And there were a few here on um, uh, long-term sickness benefit. Um, so a lot of our uh, primary carers were economically inactive that's how they self um, identified so um, and we we don't have time to tease out whether that was because they were caring or you know uh, why that was so I think that that is um, uh, it makes you know when when people are running into caring for a child who already has difficulties and needs to then also have the stress and pressure of juggling your finances is an, an additional burden. There was a link between age and finances, which is slightly, I think, different from um, what Anna was talking about. So, um, so we're not comparing people who do feel that they have enough and people who don't feel that they have enough. What we were looking at was within our sample of people that we had, was there any difference? Um, and there was a difference in terms of the age profile slightly. Um, and the older carers, were more likely to say that they felt comfortable or adequate. So in this 
24.1% of people who said that they were comfortable and the 38.9% of people who said that their finances were manageable, they were more likely to be the older carers. The people who said it was a bit of a struggle and it was challenging were more likely to be the younger carers. And that may reflect um, the fact that those younger carers also had other children that they were looking after um, and the costs associated with looking after their, you know, the, the other kids in their household as well. So we asked people about their support needs and they had some um, very clear priorities uh, for their support needs. Probably their number one support need um, was educational support for their children. Um, and 31% in total referred to the need for educational support. So children had a range of difficulties that impacted on them in school, okay? ADHD, autistic spectrum disorders, behavioral and emotional difficulties that had come from their experience of adversity before they came to live in foster care, okay? Um, and sometimes it was the children's interface with school that had been part of the catalyst that meant that the child had to come into foster care in the first place. They really identified need for help with the interface with school and also help to allow those children to engage well in their education. Probably the next biggest um, uh, thing that people talked about uh, was independent advice and support, particularly at the beginning, and just basic information um, and information about what pe they were entitled to. And that ranged from big things like allowances, legal advice, some, you know, you mentioned about residence orders, to very small things like, I wish somebody had told me that I could claim mileage for taking the child to contact. Okay, so big information needs, small information needs, but a very clear need for information and guidance. Um, another uh, issue was managing contact with birth parents and siblings. Okay, now we could talk all day about what the shift in roles between moving from being a grandmother to your grandchildren, a mother to your daughter, to becoming a foster carer for social services a foster carer for your grandchildren and somebody has to tell your daughter that she can't just come and go as she pleases. Okay, so the dynamics of that are, you know, you could talk all day about that, but it's safe to say that that was challenging and one of the things um, people uh, had a, a, an issue with. Um, and we've already mentioned uh, the, the, the finances um, okay, I'm just looking here, sorry, my notes for um, their evaluation of their evaluation of um, supports. Um, I think the good news was I think there was um, two minutes. All right, um, does that include Kathleen? <laughs> we may need more than two minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, on the support uh, services or interface with social workers, um, it was heartening that only 10% of our sample said that their, their relationship with social workers had been unhelpful. More than half said that their, their relationship with social workers had been helpful um, and the rest were satisfied with that, that relationship. And one of the things to come out of our interview very much about what was helpful um, was A, around actual provision of practical supports, but relationship. People who got and understood and could empathize with the situation, who were there, who were dependable, who were competent. And I think that's heartening for social workers because actually that doesn't take great resources. Now it's hard if social workers are stressed, but it doesn't take a great deal of resources to be empathic and understanding and, and listening. So that was happening. I'll very quickly take you through some of the themes from our interviews then. So instead we had nine people interviewed um, and so theme one was everything changed from then and it's been mentioned that most of these placements were made um, uh, in a hurry, in an emergency and everything changed. So there were phone calls in the middle of the night for some people, everything changed from then. But the consequences of that for people was that they had to make a very quick decision. And as Kathleen said, they didn't have time to think about it. We didn't choose this, it was thrust upon us. Um, and that there is that the blood relation imposes a duty to care, that there's a sense of having an obligation to care for your kin that 
left people feeling a bit ambivalent and conflicted. Because of the um, emergency nature of those placements, one of the biggest issues was provision of support at the time because there was very little preparation. There weren't beds, there weren't cots, there weren't prams. Sometimes children were arriving with nothing except the clothes on their back, which weren't very clean sometimes, okay? Um, and so one of the things that we identified from this is how great it would be if there just was an initial, very easily accessed pot of money or resources that could just be given in an emergency before the assessments are completed. Um, it's hard to trust people now, so people did have varying experiences in the interview um, with social workers and relationships could break down at that very difficult initial stage. Okay? Once it got bedded down, people were happier, but in that initial phase um, of uh, their relationships, um, th people really struggled with that and they really appreciated um, uh, social workers who were there, who didn't chop and change, um, and who could who could be accessible and who were were just available when they were needed. Um, I've already talked a bit about their support needs, education being the big big one. These are all direct quotes from people, um, and that is important to bear in mind because farmers' study of kinship care, um, there was a. There was a link between children struggling in school and placement breakdown. Um, the stress and the impact of children struggling at school, I think we can't underestimate. I think we really need to pay attention to this, that people were saying, actually, for us, school is the big, big one. Um, none of the uh, carers had respite arrangements or anything like that in place. Um, and then the fourth thing to come out of that was just uh, the tenacity of foster carers. We decided we weren't giving up, okay? And this um, obligation of kinship care, and it's been reflected in other studies, again, farmer study, you know, where kinship foster carers will blatter on um, probably longer um, than other people, but actually we need to question the level of stress <laughs> that people are under um, as they're doing that. Um, I'll just leave you with, um, Kathleen's going to do the messages for research, but I just want to leave you with one um, quotation from a foster care um, that sums up some of that. And they said, my main message is this, kinship carers need more advice about their entitlements from social services at the start. We could not have predicted that we were going to become kinship carers. It came out of the blue. Such a shock for all of us. Um, and I think that kind of summed up where people uh, were at with that. So Kathy's going to talk through some of the... Is that all right, Paula? Sorry. Are you all dying for caffeine? <laughs> I think Mandy's covered the, the, the biggest majority of what, it, uh, what we covered in the survey. And I think for us that was important in terms of looking at our provision um, as an organisation. But I think it's, we've also been able to feed some of that into developments around policy and, and practice as well. I suppose that some of the key messages that came out are the absolute importance of grandparents. Um, and sustaining relationships and maintaining relationships about the range of placement options that we need for children and young people that one size doesn't fit all. Sometimes kinship care works very well for some children, but for some children it doesn't work well. And that we, um, you know, we can't just say non-relative care works, kinship care works, um, adoption works. There are lots of different provisions and some for some children one thing you know, will move into another and that we need to keep an open mind around what actually meets the needs of the children as well and that that's quite a challenge and and you know it is quite a di difficult set of, of conversations key things were health related concerns that came out in the research that there were a lot of the people that we spoke to and that we know within our, our kinship cares who do have health related issues um, often stress related issues and um, and that perhaps are exacerbated by the situation they find themselves in so a lot of them expressed that they were experiencing very high levels of stress on an ongoing basis and they, because they felt they had to stick with it and they had no option was often what people would say, we had no option but to do this, that those stress levels didn't go down, that there was no sense that we can get um, a period of time when you know, things will settle, there was just this sense that it would continue to be very stressful. The importance of relationships was really important not just within the family but with social services and the different other agencies including school 
because school could also be another high level of stress. Someone sees Granny dropping Johnny off at school and just assumes Granny's looking after the child, don't realise that perhaps that grandparent has that child 24-7 and there are lots of complexities there. Um, education was a very big one because kinship carers were really adamant that those children should have opportunities to develop, that they should, their aspirations should be encouraged and they wanted something different for them. So there was a real sense that we're doing this because we want something different from what they experienced and there were frustrations for them in engaging with education. And the complex nature of contact was just um, peppered throughout the entire thing. It's such a complex set of arrangements. And, and also one of the things we haven't perhaps mentioned is the challenging needs and behaviours of some of the children. Some of the children um, that uh, the kinship carers looked after had extremely complex needs, had um, high levels of learning disability. Um, I mean, I'm aware of a number of our uh, kinship carers who look after children who have really extreme levels of disability. And, you know, so they're just not interfacing with social services, but with disability teams, the whole range of professionals um, that they hadn't expected to do, usually in their late 50s and early 60s, because perhaps they're looking after their, their children's children. And they thought they had got up and on and beyond that. Um, one, I'll leave you with this one, a set of grandparents who had got their four children up, as they said, up and away. And um, one night they got a, a telephone call from social services and they find themselves with a seven week old baby, a 10 month old baby and a two and a half year old, which was like having, as they said, a set of triplets, um, an emergency set of triplets and you didn't even know you were pregnant. And they had parenting skills, so they had a bit of a start, but they were completely overwhelmed and they needed lots of time and lots of support and that support needed to be tailored to them, not just generic. So I think there are a lot of lessons both for research and for practice um, emerging from this. Thank you. Yeah, that's the